Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I'm Claire, editor of Medical Chronicle, joined here by Dr. Leon Levine and Dr. Kay Mohammed, as well as Dr. Obi Okafor from Thermo Fisher Scientific, who are the sponsors of this webinar. Tonight, we will be discussing understanding HIV drug resistance in the first of a series of three webinars. But first, some guidance for this webinar. If you have a bad connection, there's a box at the top of your screen that says reconnect. Please click this button if you have any issues. It will bring you right back into the webinar. There will be a recording of the webinar available to watch. CPD points are allocated based on viewing time, so please watch the full presentation. And we no longer issue CPD certificates directly, but pass on this data to the HPCSA, and you can view your points on their CPD portal. Please type any questions that you have for the doctors in the Q&A only box provided. It's the tab next to the chat box, and we'll get to those after the webinar. I need to point out that we will not be addressing any off-label use of products, and as per CPD requirements, no brand names, please, active ingredients only. To introduce Dr. Obi Okafor, she is the medical and scientific affairs lead at Thermo Fisher's global health and equity business. She works with the members of scientific communities in low resource settings to adapt and improve diagnostic products to meet their unique needs. Prior to this role, Dr. Okafor served as a consultant with the World Health Organization on the Global Maternal Sepsis Study and a researcher at Harvard University studying health disparities. She also worked as field staff implementing HIV and other public health programs and as a clinical, clinician at several levels of healthcare institutions providing care to individuals living with HIV. Dr. Okafor earned her master's and doctorate degree from Harvard University in Boston and her medical degree from Kazar University in Azerbaijan. I will now hand over to Dr. Okafor, who will introduce our two presenters tonight. Thank you so much, Claire. I'll start by introducing Dr. Levin. So Dr. Leon Levin is a pediatrician who has been treating HIV-infected infants, children, and adolescents for the past 26 years. From 2013 to 2018, he was the head of the pediatric HIV program and is currently the chief technical specialist at Right to Care NGO. He was also the chairman of the pediatric subcommittee of the South African HIV Clinician Society from 1999 to 2011, and he was the convener of the Southern African HIV Clinician Society Pediatric Antiretroviral Guidelines in 2000. 2002 and 2005, he was also a co-convener of these guidelines in 2009. Dr. Levine has regularly been on the South African Department of Health Pediatric and Adolescent ART Guideline Committee and is on the Pediatric Third Line ART Committee for the South African Department of Health. Since 2011, Dr. Levine has been running HIV viral resistance workshop throughout Africa, and he has given numerous other lectures. His current areas of interest include infants, children, and adolescents living with HIV, new pediatric ART formulations, treatment failure, drug resistance, as well as HIV disclosure to adolescents. He has a small private practice and has seen many, many of his patients grow up from infancy to adulthood. And so we really want to thank Dr. Leon Levin for the presentation today. And second, I will introduce Dr. K. Mohammed. Dr. K. Mohammed is a HIV clinician based at NetCare Guardian City Hospital and is also the lead consultant for HIV disease management companies. She has been a medical doctor for 36 years and has over 16 years of experience in managing um, management of HIV AIDS and related diseases. Dr. Mohammed's passion extends beyond patient care to training of doctors, nurses, and other healthcare workers. Dr. Mohammed has been involved in HIV teaching, training, and patient care for the past 16 years. Her latest publication was a case report on the emergence of dolutegravir resistance in a patient on a second on second line antiretroviral therapy in the Southern African Journal of HIV Medicine. Um, and so we want to thank again Dr. K 
and Dr. Um, Leon Levin for this presentation. And I'll hand over to um, Claire to start this. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so much for, for asking um, me and uh, Dr. K to give this talk. Um, Claire, are you going to be reading the... Yes, I will. Yeah. Okay, Thanks. so Thermo Fisher Scientific and its affiliates are not endorsing, recommending or promoting any use or application of Thermo Fisher Scientific products presented by third parties during this webinar. Information and materials presented or provided by third parties are provided as is and without warranty of any kind, including regarding intellectual property rights and exported results. Parties presenting images, text and material represent, um, represent they have the right to do so. Thermo Fisher has provided funding for this webinar. Thanks. Okay. So before we start, I thought we could just start with a, little, a very quick poll to get you also into the swing of, of doing polls. This one's very easy. Um, and Claire, I think you can launch it now. We just basically want to know sort of who we've got in the webinar um, and which description closest, closely fits your, your profession. Is it, have you launched already, Okay. Yes, it's in the side panel. So oh, yeah, we've... Okay. Um, Great. GP and private practice is leading so far. It's yeah, I can see fluctuating. Mm, it's like watching horses run out of a starting a race and see who's <laughs> going to win. It's a little bit intimidating that virologist column. Or is that zero? Oh, no, it's, it's, it's one percent, two percent virologist. Yeah, yeah. Very okay. Should we should we end yeah, it there? Let's end it there. Okay. Will you share it with us so we can see? Oh, sorry. It was. I... Oh, we zeroed it. <laughs> sorry. When I ended it, it took it away. Oh, okay. All right. Um, so it looks, it seems like there's, there's a fair mix with, um, if I can remember correctly, very few virologists, but there are mostly GPs and or a couple of other medical specialists. Okay, that's very interesting. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're going to be talking about resistance, but there's no ways that you can understand resistance unless you actually understand what is a viral load. Now, we all know that a viral load you know, it tells us the number of copies of the virus per milliliter of blood. But what does it really tell us? How does it help us to manage our patients? So to do that, I'm, also, I'm going to do another poll quickly. Uh, and it's multiple choice. I'd like to know from you, where in the body would you find a significant amount of HIV? 5% of the total HIV of the body. In the blood, the liver, the lymph nodes, or the spleen. And it's multiple choice. If you think more than one is correct, you can answer more than one. Where would you find a significant amount of HIV in the, in, in the body? More than 5%. Would you find it in the blood? Would you find it in the liver, the lymph nodes, and the spleen, or the spleen? Okay, it's looking very interesting. All right, uh, I think let's end the poll now, and um, don't reset it yet. Can, can the audience see this now? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so very interesting. 61% of you felt it was in the blood, and 35% the lymph nodes, and are smattering the liver and the spleen. And you'd be very surprised at the, the answer. Do we find it in the blood? No. Less than 5% of the HIV in the body is in the bloodstream. The rest is, as you said, lymph nodes, but also in the liver and the spleen. So in other words, the reticular endothelial system, and it's, it's logical if you think of it. HIV lives in CD4 cells largely, right? CD4 cells are found in the lymph nodes, the CD4 lymphocytes, right? So you don't find it in the blood normally. So what does it mean 
when we do a, a test and it's picking up HIV in the blood, what is that telling us? What does it mean to finding HIV in the blood? So the next picture, unfortunately, I had to remove the photograph because I, I it is an old picture. I couldn't manage to, to get hold of the person to ask permission to use the photograph. But it was a woman sitting in her lounge with water up to her ankles, not looking very happy. And my question was, is there a problem with the lounge that there's water there? And obviously the answer is no, we don't have any taps in our lounges, right? So if there was water, it's coming from elsewhere. Either it was a leaking roof or a burst pipe somewhere, and that water flooded into her lounge and so she had water in her lounge. So it's the same thing with the viral load. We're not supposed to find virus in the blood. So what does it mean if you find it in the blood? It's telling us that just like water in the lounge tells us that elsewhere in the house, there's a problem with overproduction of water. So finding virus in the bloodstream is telling us that elsewhere in the body is a problem of overproduction of virus. In other words, viral load means that what is the virus doing? That the viral load is up. It means that this virus is making billions and billions of baby viruses, which then spill over into the bloodstream. So in other words, viral load equals viral replication. Okay, viral load equals viral replication. If the viral load is very high, this virus is multiplying big time. If the viral load is low but detectable, three, four, five thousand, it's replicating but slowly but still spilling over into the bloodstream. And if it's undetectable, it's technically not replicating. We know it's ticking over slowly, but technically it's not replicating, so it doesn't spill over into the bloodstream. And that's our undetectable viral load, which Dr. K is going to talk more about a bit later on. Okay, so very important to understand viral load equals viral replication. Right, now if you know that, we can understand HIV antiretroviral resistance. Can you imagine a cell phone factory producing 10 billion phones every day? That's equivalent to 1,500 a second. 1,500, 1,500, 1,500. Can you imagine at that rate of producing cell phones, What's the chance that every phone is going to come out perfect? And I don't need to do a poll to know that obviously there will be mistakes. At that rate, there will be mistakes. And how often does this, and no, sorry, there will be mistakes. Now, the HIV virus also produces 10 billion viruses every single day. And so it also makes mistakes. How often does it make mistakes? Well, literally every time it reproduces itself. One cycle mistake for every cycle of replication. Now, the, the viral enzyme reverse transcriptase that converts the viral RNA to DNA doesn't have a proofreading mechanism. For proofreading mechanism, read spell checker. You can see I needed a spell checker there to correct my, my mistake, my spelling mistake. But so the virus makes a mistake. It can't say, oh, come, come back. I made a mistake. It's too late. It goes through as a new virus. We call it a new quasi species. And those mistakes we call mutations. And there are millions of this, those mutations formed every single day. Now, the scientists tell us this, and listen very carefully. The scientists tell us that in a patient who's not on ARVs, okay, listen to this, every day that virus will produce resistance mutations against every single drug. I'm going to say it again. The patient who's not on ARVs, every day, that virus will produce resistance mutations against every single drug. And now I know your question. You're going to say, if that's the case, why do ARVs work? Well, these mutations are, they mutated. They're crippled. They can't replicate very rapidly. And so what happens is you've got, remember, 10 billion viruses produced every day. You've got this poor crippled virus. He hobbles over to a CD4 cell. By the time he gets there, there are a thousand viruses there before him. He doesn't get a chance to replicate. And so these mutations just fizzle out and die. So in a normal setting, someone who's not in ARVs will produce mutations against all the, the drugs, but they will just fizzle out and die. But if there's a situation where there are there's some low levels of ARVs around, which suppress all the other viruses, then this weak and crippled virus can replicate at its own rate and take hold of the body. And that's how resistance develops. So let me show you this in some, some very beautiful slides that were produced by one of my colleagues um, who um, usually helps me together with these, uh, these resistance workshops, Dr. Julia Turner. So we need two things for resistance to develop. 
Number one, viral replication. And number two, low levels of AOVs in the body. Let's look at different scenarios. Let's take a first a patient who's not on AOVs at all. All right. So like we said, 10 billion viruses produced every day. They're going to make mistakes, mutations. There's one there. There's one there. But they can't keep up with this unbelievable replication that they just fizzle out and die. So we've got lots of replication, but no resistance. Let's look at the opposite end of the spectrum. A patient who's fully adhere and taking the treatment. They've got high levels, sufficient levels of AOVs. What have you got? Nothing. No replication because the AOVs are working. So no resistance. So on the one end of the spectrum, no AOVs, lots of replication, no resistance. The other end of the spectrum, no replication, no resistance. But somewhere in the middle, where the patient's taking their medicines now and again, right, where it's not enough to stop replication, but just enough to control the other susceptible viruses, that's when we get resistance developing. And look at this slide here. Low levels of AOVs. So the low levels are sufficient to suppress all the other susceptible viruses, and but not enough to stop replication. So you do have mutations being formed. And now this weakened, crippled mutation that replicates so slowly doesn't really matter because there's no competition, no other viruses around. And so it can replicate very slowly and infect more and more cells and eventually infect long-lived cells in the body and that's how resistance takes hold of the body okay resistance once it's there it remains for the rest of that patient's life so the poor adherence doesn't cause the resistance it selects for that resistance which is as we said produced every day so replication by replication by low levels of AOVs gives you hrv resistance so i hope that's very clear to everybody how resistance develops Okay, let's do a, another poll, poll number three, our last poll. It's also quite a complicated one, but I'm sure you guys will be fine with it. You see two patients in your clinic with the following viral loads. One with a viral load of 2,000 copies per mole, the other one with a viral load of 200 copies, 200,000 copies per mole. Which one do you think is most likely to have resistance? And I'll just clarify that to say both could definitely have resistance, but which one is more likely to have resistance? The viral loads of 2,000 or the viral loads of 200,000. Yeah, that's a very, very impressive poll. All right. Claire, I think let's end it there and end the poll. All right. So I can see we're preaching to the converted here because you can see 65% of people felt it was 2,000 and 34% felt 200,000. I must confess that when I first got involved in the field, I felt it also it had to be 200,000, such a high number, had to be the one with resistance. But if you think about it, what do we say? Viral load because viral replication. So if the patient has got no resistance, those viruses are replicating really rapidly, they're very aggressive, you can have a very high viral load. If they've got resistance, right, the virus replicates very slowly. And we said that slowly replicating slowly you're going to get less virus spilling over the bloodstream and you'll have a lower but detectable viral load so if someone comes into your clinic with a sky high viral load 300,000, you can be pretty certain that that patient is non-adherent they're not taking the treatment it's not a, it's a good general rule it's not absolute if they come to your clinic with a viral load of 2000 3000 that is more likely to be someone who's taking the treatment the treatment is suppressing all the suppress the susceptible viruses and all that remains are the weak and crippled viruses, which replicates very slowly. So you get a low but detectable viral load. To show that the viral uh, re regimen is working, you need to see a suppressed viral load. Okay. So we, people always talk about a, a one log drop in the viral load, right? A one log drop. So what is that telling us? It tells us the patient is adherent. Because it's gone, for example, this example, from 200,000 to 2,000, that's a two log drop, right? Chop two noughts off it. It's a two, two log, log drop. So that's telling us that this patient is taking the treatment, right? But is it telling us that the regimen is working? No, because in this case, you can see they're taking the treatment, they suppressed all the susceptible viruses, and now the weak and crippled virus is replicating at a slower rate. So a one log drop is telling us the patient is adherent, not necessarily telling us that the regimen is working. To know the regimen is working, we have to see a suppressed viral load. Okay, let's continue. So there are some definitions we need to get out of the way. 
acquired drug resistance is what most of us deal with, where the patient starts off with no resistance, or they may have some resistance, whatever, but through their actions, they do not taking the treatment properly, they develop resistance to their regimen. So acquired drug resistance is where um, resistance develops in a patient who is on treatment. Now, transmitted drug resistance, patient who gets HIV for the first time, and already there is some resistance to one or more of those drugs. Um, obviously, the person they got it from wasn't taking the treatment properly, and then they picked that up. And then there's a, there's a, a third category that's called pre-treatment drug resistance, because sometimes we don't always know if a person who's starting treatment has been on treatment before or not. Sometimes people feel uncomfortable telling us, and we, so we don't always know. So we have a category of pre-treatment drug resistance, which is in patients who are starting or restarting treatment. As we say, we don't always know which category they're filling. And so they could either be transmitted resistance or acquired resistance. And those are the three categories you need to know. Okay. So this is just a, a slide from WHO showing that pre-treatment drug resistance is largely in the non-nucleoside class, the virapine and efavirenz, okay, and also some in the NRTI class. Whereas in the PI class, because the PIs, as Dr. K is going to tell us, develop resistance with much more difficulty, and also they use second line, so they're not used as much as, as the non-nucleosides were used. So transmitted resistance uh, or pre-drug resistance as well is much less common in the PI class as compared to the non-nucleoside or the NRTI class. And also because the, the int integrase inhibitors, the NST class, is so new and also develops resistance with great difficulty, resistance to the uh, integrase inhibitors is rare. Right, so how do people acquire resistance? What are they doing to develop resistance? So the vast majority are not taking the treatment properly as we discussed, and so you get low levels of AOVs with replication and you get viral resistance. That depends on the drugs. Some drugs, as Dr. K will tell us, become resistant quicker than others. Some, if they've got a low ba resistant barrier to resist resistance, they'll develop resistance very quickly, one or two mutations. If you've got a high resistance uh, barrier to resistance, then it will take many mutations to develop resistance. Okay, so poor adherence is probably the commonest. If it's a mother or a child, PNTCT can certainly cause uh, resistance to, to, to the ARVs. And then there's a small but very important category where people are taking their ARVs, but for some reason they're, they're not working, they're getting low levels in the blood and then can develop resistance. For example, malabsorption, someone patients are not absorbing their drugs, or food effects, they're supposed to take the drug on an empty stomach and they're taking it with food and that reduces the absorption and so you, they are then liable to get resistance. In a pediatric patient, for example, if you're not increasing dosages as they grow, they can get um, um, resistance because of inadequate dosages. But the, probably the most important in this group are drug-drug interactions, of which the most important that we see is the TV drugs with ampicin together with the pinaritonava and dolutegravir. Um, th those interactions can cause resistance. And certainly on the Pediatric um, Resistance Committee, the Department of Health, the vast majority of our young children who are needing third-line drugs are because of this interaction between rif ampicin and the lopinavirotonava. So very important. And obviously, people not correcting for it. We know how to correct for it. For, for it but obviously not happening, and we end up with, with young babies um, needing a third line. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Dr. K. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Levine. I'm now going to discuss the prevalence and the incidence of HIV. I'm going to start first with the global population. So in total, we have about 40 million, um, 40 million people in total who have HIV, of which about 1.5 million had acquired it in a year. And one can see 37 million people of that 40 million people are adults. And I just want you to take note here, about 20 million are women and about 17 million are men. So one can see just from these stats that the um, um, incidence of people and prevalence of HIV is quite high. So do remember, I, I want you to take note of 
as having 20 million women with HIV and about 17 million men with HIV. So that's a global population. The prevalence and incidence of our local population is we have 8.5 million people living with HIV in South Africa. So 20% of all people living with HIV are in this country. 20% of all new infections occur in this country. And we can see we have in excess of 5 million women who have HIV and 2.5 million men. So we have twice as many women who have HIV in this country as opposed to men. But having said all of that, we need to realize that South Africa has the largest number of people enrolled into the ART program in the world. And remember in 2016, we introduced the universal test and treat program. I'm just gonna pay a little bit of attention to pregnant women Globally, 1.3 million women living with HIV get pregnant every year. 85% of these women have access to ARVs, and in this way, we prevent mother-to-child transmission. The rate of transmission from mother to child has decreased from 40% to 2%. And remember, transmission can occur during pregnancy, labor, delivery, and during breastfeeding. Breastfeeding transmission is now the commonest mode of mother-to-child transmission in South Africa. Hence, the postnatal care in terms of viral suppression is so important in all these mothers. Also remember that even if you are seeing patients who are HIV negative, it is so important to test them every three months throughout their pregnancy because about 8 to 12 percent will seroconvert terminally. So do not forget the HIV negative women as well. Um, do remember that if we are going to do breastfeeding, it has to be exclusive breastfeeding. And if babies are to be formula fed, it has to be exclusive formula feeding. There is no mixed feeding. In terms of infants, 86% of HIV-positive infants are in sub-Saharan Africa. But since 2010, we know there's been a rapid decline in the transmission from mother to child. Like I've said previously, the main mode of transmission now is breastfeeding. We have an average of about 43,000 new infections in South Africa. I just want to go on to explain again, the influence of drug susceptibility to resistance. And I want you to, I'm going to go through these slides a little bit slower so that everyone understands it, because if you understand these um, things that affect drugs, then you will understand later on how we select what drugs we choose. So understanding factors that influence ARV susceptibility to resistance, I'm going to first look at the ARV genetic barriers, and I'm going to start with the nucleosides. And we know for certain that the nucleoside forms the backbone of heart. And with the nucleosides, we have some drugs that have a low genetic barrier to resistance and other drugs that have a high genetic barrier to resistance. Now, it's important to understand that what we mean by a low genetic barrier to resistance is that we just need one mutation and we can lose that drug. And drugs that have a high genetic barrier to resistance, we need many mutations, so it becomes very difficult to lose those drugs easily. So the two drugs you need to remember very clearly is tenofovir and zidovudine have a high barrier to resistance. We're not using too much of zidovudine nowadays, so the thing to remember is tenofovir has a high barrier to resistance, while lamivudine, emtricitipine, and abacava have a low barrier to resistance. So remember, the bottom three we can lose very quickly. And then we have the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. These also formed first line of heart previously. And we have nevirapine and efavirenz here that have 
really low barriers to resistance. So what this means is that we can develop resistance to novirapine and efavirenz very quickly, while rilpivirine and atravirine have higher barriers to resistance. And then I want to go on to the integrase inhibitors. And it's absolutely important to pay attention now because Dolutegravir has just changed the way we see things nowadays. The two big integrase inhibitors we using or used was Dolutegravir and Raltegravir. Now, if you look at this diagram, you will see that Dolutegravir has a very, very high genetic barrier to resistance. And also it's extremely potent whereas Raltegravir doesn't have that high genetic barrier to resistance or potency. So if you just compare these two, you can see Dolutegravir is in a class of its own, and going forward, you will understand why we need to use Dolutegravir going forward. In this diagram, you're going to see the drug potency of the protease inhibitors, and you can see the three that I've ringed in this slide. On the extreme right, we have darunavir, then we have lopinavir, and then we have atazanavir. So again here, you can see darunavir has the highest genetic barrier to resistance, followed by lopinavir and atazanavir. What this means is that one needs many, many mutations before one would get resistance to these drugs, and it is quite difficult to get resistance to these drugs. So please take note of darunavir followed by lopinavir and then atazanavir, but darunavir stands right out there. And remember, all these drugs are boosted with ritonavir as well. Now I need for you to understand what the susceptibility of drug-resistant HIV means. And what this means is that we get resistance mutations that decrease the sensitivity of one drug, but increase the susceptibility of another drug. So all the different classes of drugs do this, but I'm just going to focus on number one, which focuses on the NRTI increased susceptibility. So you can see what I've ring there is the M184V mutation which is selected for by 3TC and FTC. So what that mutation does, it can make tenofovir and zidovudine more potent. So do keep in mind the M184V mutation that makes tenofovir work better. And I do want to show it to you in this slide as well, that in the old days when we used 3TC monotherapy, but this is going back a long, long time ago, the viral load would drop, and then we would get the emergence of the M184V mutation. And you can see from this slide that the viral load never returns to normal and is always lower. So this mutation does definitely cripple the 3TC um, drug. So the other thing one needs to understand when thinking about ARV drug susceptibility to resistance is we need to understand cross-resistance. What cross-resistance means is that we get resistance to one drug resulting from a mutation selected for by another drug. In short, what this means is that you may be exposed to one drug but get resistance mutations to other drugs that you haven't been exposed to. But it's important to understand that the cross-resistance only happens in the same class of drugs. So if you look at the NRTIs, we can get cross-resistance between D4T and AZT, and also we can get cross-resistance to a Abacavir with three TAMs and the M184V mutation. With the NNRTIs, this class of drugs gives us the highest level of cross-resistance. And in this class of drugs, like I said, we have efavirenz and navirapine. So if you get the K103N resistance, 
you will knock off efavirenz and novirapine, even though you would have only been exposed to one. Whereas like the Y181C will give you resistance to efavirenz, novirapine and etravirine, even though you were only exposed to one drug. With the integrase inhibitors, one needs to also remember that raltegravir can give cross resistance to dolutegravir. So in taking histories, one always must ask about raltegravir usage prior to dol dolutegravir. And with the PIs, one always would need a resistance test. So what one would like to know is one needs to be very aware we don't want resistance. So we need to reduce the risk of resistance. And there are many ways, many things we need to be very aware of. So at a global level or more like at a national level, what one needs to be aware of is things that concern drugs. So the first thing I'm going to discuss is PrEP. And I need for everyone to understand that we give PrEP to HIV negative individuals so that they continue to remain HIV negative. And in this way, we prevent infections. So don't always just think of treating HIV positive in individuals, always think of PrEP as well in HIV negative individuals. Then also remember U equals U, which means undetectable equals untransmittable. This is so important. If you are undetectable, you are, un you are not going to be transmitting virus, not to your partner, not to your babies, not in those communities. And this is one absolutely important thing to understand that regular viral load monitoring is so crucial and not just regular viral load monitoring, but insisting on viral loads being undetectable. Also, one needs to understand that the best treatment regimen will provide the highest barrier for viral resistance. And what this means is that we need to choose the best drugs, because if we choose the best drugs with the highest genetic barrier for resistance, we are not going to get too much of resistance and this is why in November of 2019, we switched from TE to TLD. So we took the efavirenz out and replaced it with dolutegravir. And like I've said in my previous slides, dolutegravir has the highest genetic barrier to viral resistance. And we can use dolutegravir in first line, second line, and third line regimens. Another thing to take note of here as well is that we've had two important trials that have come up, the Nadia and the Ernest trials. And what Nadia and Ernest has taught us is that if we're using dolutegravir or a PI, we can recycle the NRTIs. The other things to remember in terms of reducing the risk of resistance is issues that concern the clinician. And this is very evident in doctors who have an interest in HIV as opposed to doctors who don't because their outcomes are completely different. So the cl clinician who is confident and competent would understand how to dose drugs, how to switch drugs, drug interactions. Also, he would take that extra time to educate his patients. And if you educate your patients on what the virus does, what drugs do, and what defaulting means, you've then left the care of HIV in the patient's hands and they go on to do really well. And also the doctors need to understand the side effects. And like I said, the talk prior to this um, on, on genetic barriers, if you understand all of this, just makes you more solid as a clinician. And then we have patient factors and with patient factors, like I say, an education is so important to let patients know undetectable is untransmittable. And what this equates to in real life is you can go on and live an absolutely normal life. You would have no HIV issues. You'll have issues with every other aspect of your life, but nothing related to HIV. As long as you remember to take your meds and never miss your doses. 
But one thing we also need to understand, especially in this country, that HIV comes with a lot of stigma. And we need to teach patients, even if it's at an individual level, to not self-stigmatize. And the key to preventing resistance is adherence. Adherence, adherence, adherence all the time. You have to take your drugs if you want them to work properly. And then one also needs to support key populations like men who have sex with men, female sex workers, prisoners, transgender people as well. And to also take note that sometimes people add added stuff into the ARVs, like they would have immune boosters, immune stimulants, herbal medication, and all of this could impact the bioavailability of the ARVs and lead to ARV resistance. Dr. Levine did also make note of viral factors like high replication rates and no proofreading, and also drug factors, which he'd also mentioned, like inappropriate dosing as children grow up, drug-drug interactions. He's mentioned TB drugs. Also, we have epilepsy drugs, and we have ulcer treatment, and poor absorption as well. I hand over now to Dr. Levine. Thanks. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the tests that we used for resistance. And I must just tell you, the only one really that we're using in South Africa is the second one, the genotyping or the genotypic assay. So the phenotypic assay, the first one, just get it out the way. That is like the equivalent of a, an, an MCNS. You do a throat swab for MCNS, they culture the streptococcus with antibiotics, and then they can say, well, this drug will work, this drug won't work. And the phenotyping is very similar. It's not exactly culturing the virus, culturing bits of the virus, but that's equivalent. But the problem is it's really expensive, very time consuming. Um, when last I checked, it was something like $2,000, but I think it's probably more than that. It was a good few years ago when I checked. And very few labs are actually doing it, certainly none in South Africa. I think there's probably only, only one in the US that's doing it. So we don't do genotyping. What we do, we don't do phenotyping, we do genotyping. So what's genotyping? Genotyping is where they analyze the, the genetic makeup of the virus. And from that, they can then extrapolate from the mutations that they found what resistance there's going to be. And that's what, what we use all the time. Um, there are a, a couple of different assays. Um, the one that's standard, one that's available, population-based, okay, will only pick up 20 to 30% of the population. Um, and that's the one, the standard one that, that we have available. There are what they call minority variant assays, which will pick up less than 20 to 30% of the population, but that's not available in South Africa. Um, but I say, this is the one you want to remember, the genotype testing. Then the third one I want to talk about is something that's also not available here. It's very interesting, but it's not available here. So what if the patient has got a suppressed viral load? Can you still determine their resistance. So you'd say, well, why do we need to? They suppress, treatment is working. But we've got new developments, new treatments, for example, the injectable treatment that's available now. And people overseas are saying, look, I've got a suppressed patient. Can they change to the injectables? So we need to go back and say, well, do they have resistance to the drugs that are in the injectables, especially the rolpivirine, which is a non-nucleoside? And so they use what they call pro-viral DNA genotypic resistance testing, where they don't look at the RNA like we do with our normal testing, which looks at the, the viral load, which is RNA, and, and, and they look at resistance in the RNA. It looks at DNA of the virus that is integrated in the host cell. And all, over all the years, every time the new mutation integrates into the host cells, in, in, the, in the, the, the peripheral mononuclear cells, and so they can go back now and look at that DNA and pick up those mutations. Unfortunately, three problems. Number one, okay, it's um, not very sensitive. Number two, not very specific. And the third one, it's not available in South Africa. So it's nice to know about, it is being used in situations as when people are suppressed and they, they, they need to know what previous mutations they've got, but it's not something that we have available to us in South Africa. Okay, so let's talk about the clinical implications of resistance testing. Very important first point. It only will tell us about that regimen that the patient is taking at that point in time. Okay, if the patient stops taking the treatment, those mutations will disappear. Some disappear quicker than others, but they will disappear. And after a month, 
it's not a reliable test anymore. Um, and if it's a long, very long time of that, the, the mutations may have disappeared completely, but they are still there. They remain there, but they call it archived. They remain hidden in the body, like in a library, okay, and they will come out. When the patient goes back onto that class of drug, those mutations, the, that resistance virus will come back up. So it's very easy overseas where they do resistance testing, you know, after first line, after, sorry, baseline, then first line, second line. So you know exactly what resistance that patient has. We don't have that in South Africa. We are doing resistance testing after second line failures generally. Okay, so you then will get a, a, an idea of what's going on for this regimen, but you don't know about previous regimens. And so you have to look at the patient's previous history um, and if it's a mother or child, PMTCT history, so you can get an idea. Fortunately, it's fairly straightforward in predicting what sort of resistance you can get from first line. But you've got to take that into account. If the patient does have previous resistance tests, well, then we take all the mutations from all the previous ones, put them all together. I'll show you the Stanford database, put them all in there, and we get a nice composite resistance for that patient. But as I say, we don't often have too many resistance tests on the patient, only one, and then we, we can't do that. Another uh, point which people struggle a little bit to understand is that if, if the, let's say you've got a resistance test and the patient who's failing second line, they're failing a protease inhibitor re regimen, they were on efavirenz first line. But you do the resistance test and it says resistant to efavirenz. It picks up mutations if you give it resistance to efavirenz. You can believe it. It's resistant to efavirenz. You, it's found the mutation. You can't use efavirenz. But if it says in the same scenario, it says susceptible to efavirenz, can you use efavirenz? Does it mean efavirenz is, is going to work? Not necessarily, because it could be that they're not on efavirenz at this point in time. They were on it in first line. And so it's not picking up resistance to efavirenz. So resistance testing is great for telling us this drug is no good. But if it says this drug will work, you have to look at the circumstances very carefully because it may or may not be true. Okay, there are some specific issues to resistance testing in South Africa because of what we have here. So as I mentioned, our resistance testing won't pick up resistance in the minor variant. So the resistant virus must be about 20 to 30% of the total for the test to pick it up. We don't have the test that will pick up lower than 20%. A technical issue, the viral load must be above 1,000 copies per mole although our labs are getting better and better, and I think most of the labs, including the DOH, are comfortable doing a resistance test about 400 copies per mole. But if it is under 1,000, you should just send a little note, say, sorry, it's really important that I get, I get this. I know the viral load is below 1,000, and they'll usually will try hard to try and, and do a resistance test for you. Okay, now the re resistance test results are very clearly uh, presented, tells you exactly this one will work, this one won't work, but as I said to you, you know, it's not always as it seems, so there are pitfalls for the unwary, and we suggest that you do get expert consultation. And the last point, which is which is relevant at this point in time, but we're hoping with this webinar it's going to change, is that it's very expensive at the moment. In the state, you're looking at between 2,500 to 5,000 rand a test. In private, up to 7,000 rand a test. So it is very expensive, and one of the reasons why, why this uh, webinar is taking place is because I think there are innovations, which I think Obi would love to tell us about at the end, so which is really fantastic. And uh, hopefully this is going to change in South Africa. But the, the, at the moment, it is very expensive. OK, so now if you've got a patient who's got resistance and you keep them on the failing region, what's going to happen? They're going to get more and more mutations. And the three consequences there. Number one, you get more resistance against that particular drug. So if we go from low level to intermediate to high level resistance. Number two, you get cross resistance, which Dr. Case told us about, resistance against drugs they've never even been on. And number three, remember we said that the resistant virus is generally weakened, it's crippled, it replicates very slowly, doesn't cause much damage to the immune system because it doesn't do, invade too many, uh, too many um, CD4 cells, but if you keep them on the same failing regimen, you get what they call, they call compensatory mutations, which strengthen up that virus. And so the, then it does start replicating more rapidly and infecting more CD4 cells and causing more damage to the immune system. And that could, could be a scenario, like we discussed earlier, where you can have a very high viral load, but with resistance, where they've been failing for years and years and have developed compensatory mutations. 
Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the mutation notation, right? How do we, what do we call these mutations? So you can see it looks like it's a secret code, and I think it, it probably is a bit of a secret code, but I'm going to break the code and, and tell you um, what this code means. So the number in the middle, in this case 184, that is the address of the mutation. That tells us where you'll find the mistake this virus made at position 184. They've got different numbering systems for reverse transcriptase, protease, and integrase. In this case, it's, it's reverse transcriptase. So at position 184, this is where you'll find this mutation. Now, the, the letter on the left, the M, tells us what you will find there. No. The letter on the right, the V, in this case, valine, tells us what's there instead. So this virus made a mistake by putting a valine at position 184 instead of a methionine. And that causes resistance to 3TC. This is a classic 3TC resistance mutation. Um, because the M is always constant, we sometimes leave it out and just say 184V. Um, but if you say 184V, that tells us that's position 184, there's a valine that has been put there instead of a methionine, causing resistance to 3TC and FTC. Okay, so then the laboratories use a, a database, in this case the Stanford database, the other ones that they use, where they would put the sequences in, and we can, we can do it ourselves and put the mutations in, and then this database will then generate a, a report, and you can see there it tells you clearly that this virus has got four major PR mutations there, and with high-level resistance against atazanavir and lopinavir, and low-level resistance against darunavir. And that's how the resistance reports are generated. As I say, if the patient has been on more than one, has had more than one resistance testing done, you can take all the mutations from all of them, do it yourself on the Stanford database, and then generate a report for yourself and tell you exactly what's going on with your patient. Okay, I'm just going to finish off with this last little section. Section. Um, you know, the resistance test reports are great. Um, there are experts that can help you to interpret resistance. There's this, the different databases you can use to help you interpret resistance. But if the test is not done correctly, nobody in the world can tell you how to, can interpret that for you. So in my mind, I actually think that doing the resistance test is probably, or doing it properly, is more important than interpreting it. And you'd be surprised how often it's not done properly. And I'm going to explain to you why with a story. I'm going to tell you a battle, a story about the battle of the HIV viruses. Not us fighting the HIV viruses, but the viruses fighting each other. Because remember we said you've got susceptible virus, you've got resistant virus. They're all battling it out inside the body to become the dominant virus, the one that infects the most CD4 cells. But there's no question that there's one virus, one quasi-species, that if he is there, he's always the dominant virus. And then there's this guy here, name of WT, all right, which stands for wild type. Why is it called wild type? Because before there were any ROVs, he was the only virus that was around. And just like we say, wild grass, you know, is naturally occurring grass. So wild type virus, naturally occurring HIV virus. Now, he's a very strong virus, replicates very rapidly, will have a very high viral load, as we said, viral load because of our replication. But like any good villain, he's got a weakness. What is his weakness? His weakness is that any ARVs will kill him. Okay? Wild type virus is suppressed by any ARVs. We do resistance tests, it comes out all green, susceptible to everything. Okay. So if you've got a, a patient who's got a mixture inside their body, some resistant viruses, wild type, vir uh, wild type virus, susceptible virus, resistant viruses, and they're not on ARVs, well, clear wild type will predominate. That will be the predominant virus. The other viruses can't compete with him, so they'll be hiding away. They'll be archived. And if I don't know if you see my pointer, but if that point is the 20 to 30 percent line, so above that line, we've got wild type virus, we will get a, a test that will be tell us that this virus is susceptible to all, to all the drugs. Right, now what happens if this per person then starts taking ARV? Any ARVs, doesn't matter, right? So we know virus, wild type virus is susceptible to any ARV, so wild type virus is going to be suppressed by the ARVs. 
But then if there are resistant viruses hidden away, now they cannot come out to play, right? Because wild type is suppressed. And so now these weak and crippled viruses can come up and start to replicate because wild type is suppressed by the ARVs. And now when we do our resistance test and our line at 23% goes through the resistant viruses, and so we pick up resistance. So we'll have an accurate test because the resistant viruses come up because wild type is suppressed. But what happens if this patient stops taking the treatment? Who's going to come back? And you all, uh, sorry, and the resistance, of course, your resistance will be red and orange. So it will be uh, showing you resistance. So what's going to happen if this person stops taking the ALVs? Who's going to come back? Of course, wild type. And what's going to happen to the resistant viruses? They are going to disappear. And now, when we have our line at 30%, it only goes through wild type and misses the resistance. So if you, and you're going to get a test that looks like this, susceptible to everything, all green. And what is that test telling you? That is wild type virus. And what does it mean if you have a test that says wild type virus? It tells you that patient is not taking their ARVs, right? If they're not taking the ARVs, a so wild type has come back, the resistant viruses have disappeared. Could there still be resistance in this case? Absolutely. So a susceptible test tells you this patient is not adherent. Okay. So I'm going to show you the next two slides. So as you uh, also clearly, this is a slide learned to me by Dr. Garetti. The blue triangle drug pressures they're taking the ARVs. The green is the, the wild type virus. And you can see the wild type virus is suppressed because they're taking ARVs. The red resistant virus can predominate. And above this dotted line, you can see there's red resistant virus. So you can have an accurate test picking up the resistance. If the patient stops taking the ARVs, wild type, the green predominates, the resistant virus disappears below the line. And then you all you get is the green wild type virus and you're going to miss the resistance. So it's clear now that if you want to get an accurate test, resistance test, the patient has to be adherent. So the wild type is suppressed and the resistant virus can come up and we can measure them. Okay, so that's all good and well. But the problem is, patient comes into your room, Dr. K will tell us, are you taking your treatment? Yes, I'm taking my treatment. And we know that often they don't feel comfortable to tell us that they're not taking the treatment. So you say, you're taking, yes, I'm taking my treatment. Then you say, we're going to do this test, but it's only accurate if you're taking your treatment. Are you really taking your treatment? Now, who's going to say, you know what, doctor, I was lying. I, I wasn't really taking my treatment. So no one's going to let you catch them in a lie. Okay, so it doesn't help to do the resistance test then because they're going to say they're adherent and they're not, and you'll have wasted 7,000 Rand on a test that's going to show you that they're not adherent. So what I do is I say to them, we're going to do a very expensive test in a month's time. But this test to tell us what's going on, which treatment is working, which is not working. But it's only accurate if you take every dose for the next month. So I know you might have had problems before. doesn't matter. All I'm asking is just for the next month, take every dose, and then you do the resistance test. Okay, and I must say, since I've been doing that, I virtually never see a susceptible to all a wild-type virus. Um, so... Yes, you've got to get them to be adherent, but it's no use doing it today. They're not going to own up that they're not adherent. Give them a month to take the treatment, and then you do the resistance test. Okay, I'll hand over to Dr. K. Thank you, Dr. K. Um, Dr. Levine, I just want to add, I also use a little threat that if you're not taking your meds and the test comes back saying you're not taking it, the medical aids will make you pay for it from your own pocket. So that helps immensely. Right. I don't lie to my patients because I don't think that's true, but uh, I'm pleased to be doing that. Um, so on this slide here, we want to know how drug resistant monitoring data can be used. So what we know is that the drug resistance monitoring data can be used at a population level. And at a population level, what we know is that we can see what pretreatment HIV drug resistance we have. What I mean by that is going to be evident to you in the next slide. So what you can see in this slide is that South Africa ranks third in us having pretreatment HIV drug resistance to the NNRTIs. So we have a greater than 10% prevalence of pretreatment drug resistance to NNRTIs. 
um, the, the, the drug resistance monitoring shows us up. And what this is telling us is that we should not be using efavirenz and nevirapine in our patients because we have a pretreatment level that's too high. So at a population level, you can see how important this is. And then at an individual level as well, we can use the drug resistant monitoring data to inform us about drug resistance test pretreatment. If we want to do first line treatment failure with the NNRTIs, a second line treatment failure with PIs and the integrase inhibitors, also subsequent failures. So we, we will know what resistance tests needs to be done and how to design the new regimens following on the resistance test. So you can see that the drug resistance monitoring level is so important at um, population level and if affordable also at an individual level. I'm now going to go through the testing and the treating, treatment guidelines. Um, in, in numerous instances. So, so the first one is going to be in ARV naive adults, resistance testing and treatment in ARV naive adults. So in terms of resistance testing, it is not recommended. We do not test for resistance in our patients in ARV naive adults unless they've been on PrEP in the last six months or they have a history of sexual exposure to a person with a known drug HIV resistance who's failed ARTs before. So remember when we seeing ARV naive patients, we do not do resistance testing on them. We just start them on treatment. And the treatment we're gonna put them on is TLD. And you know exactly why we use TLD, because I just explained to you in the previous slides, the Favrins has a high level of pre-treatment HIV drug resistance. Also on other slides, I told you, we can lose it with one mutation. It has a very low genetic barrier to resistance. And we all for the dolutegravir, which has a very high genetic barrier to resistance. In terms of resistance testing in ART experienced adults, so we know what first line failures the resistance profile is totally predictable, so we don't need to do any genotyping. But in patients who fail second line, we have to do a resistance test before we switch them to third line. And we have to have a resistance test that gives us documented proof of PI and dolutegravir resistance results. And also remember, not only do we need to have the resistance tests that we need to have, and you want to make, like Dr. Levine has said, absolutely certain that the patients are on treatment when you're doing the tests, is that we need to have a viral load that's greater than 500 copies per mil. I generally, when I see patients and I'm ordering a resistance test, I always ask the lab to do a viral load and then follow this on with a PI uh, or dolutegravir resistance test. And remember, lots of labs don't do dolutegravir resistance test um, reflexly. If you're needing a dolutegravir resistance test, you need to specify. So remember, we mainly using it for patients who fail second line, especially if you're failing a PI and dolutegravir. And like Dr. Levine has explained previously as well, not only do we need the resistance test, we also need to have a full HIV history as well. We need, we need to know what drugs they were on previously. Why was it stopped? Was it stopped because of a side effect? Was it stopped because of um, um, a resistance issue? So all of that is just as important. So remember, we need to, resist, to do resistance tests in patients failing second line who are on PIs and dolutegravir. So if they're failing a PI, they need to have failed the PI on regimen two for more than two years with three high viral loads. Then we need to know that they failed dolutegravir second line. And if there's been any exposure to previous raltegravir, we need to be aware of that. We need to be aware if patients have been on TB treatment 
and whether they've been on PIs and dolutegravir with their TB treatment, maybe they, they, they weren't boosted. And also patients who are on long-term PI regimens with the concurrent decline in CD4. So in these kind of patients, we need to have resistance tests. And in terms of treatment, so if you fail first line and you were on an NNRTI, we just switch you to TLD. If you on first line and you failing dolutegravir, you need to address adherence. Resistance is highly unlikely, and most times the problem is adherence. But if you're failing dolutegravir second line, then you need to do a resistance test and get advice. And also remember, if you're failing a PI second line, you need to get a resistance test and you need to seek help. So generally how it goes is that if you've got the resistance test now, because patients have failed second line, have a look at what treatment they're on. If they're on lopinavir or atazanavir, we know we can use darunavir. And if we are going to use darunavir, we're going to use darunavir with 3TC or FTC, which I told you cripple the virus. And then the third NRTI could be either TDF or AZT, whichever has the least resistance. But if you have any bit of resistance to darunavir, then do remember you need to add dolutegravir. I think we've now omitted using a travarine, so it's very simple. Have a look at what they've used before and look at whether you're adding darunavir. And if there is any resistance to darunavir, do remember you can add dolutegravir. The 3TC, FTC is in the mix and the choice between tenofovir and AZT will depend on which has the least resistance. But I have to say we're now into the dolutegravir era because we're now rolling out dolutegravir big time and you've seen from all the other slides as to what a high genetic barrier to um, um, a genetic barrier dolutegravir has. So now we find that our preference has been to go with dolutegravir and to use an NRTI. The one NRTI will be either 3TC or FTC. And then the, the, the third drug will be an active NRTI. In cases of virological suppression, we are not doing any resistance testing. We find that there's a high level of adherence to treatment, and that is coupled with minimal acquired resistance. So when we have viral, virological suppression, we do no resistance testing. Um, in terms of testing and treatment guidelines in infants and peds, so one would always do resistance testing in infants and peds if they're less than two years old and they've been exposed to a mum who's been on a PR-based ART, if they've been infected during breastfeeding, especially if the mum's been on a PI, if they've been on TB drugs, like Dr. Levine has said, most times with kids we have resistance issues because they're on TB drugs and the TB drugs and the ARVs haven't been done properly. All um, children who fail PIs and dolutegravir, or perhaps if they were on PI monotherapy, so remember that it is absolutely important, as Dr. Levine had said, to get a proper history, not just a history from the infant in terms of what meds the infant's been on, but the mother's exposure to ARVs is just as important. So that history needs to tally with the um, resistance test as well. That is absolutely complementary. Otherwise, resistance mutations will get archived. Um, these were our old guidelines. I'm not even going to discuss any of these guidelines because Dr. Levine would be one of the doctors who's been most involved in drawing up new guidelines. And with Dolutegravir coming into play right now, the guidelines have completely changed. And I'm not even going to discuss this because the new guidelines will be out shortly. So in terms of peas, 
For children over three years and greater than 10 kilograms, we kind of follow what we're doing in adults. We're going to give them darunavir, and we're going to add 3TC or FTC to that. But do remember in children, we're not going to add tenofovir because of its effect in bones. So we would prefer to choose either a Bacovir or AZT, all depending on which has the lowest resistance. And then if you're still having a lot of resistance to that, remember we can add dolutegravir into the mix. I think the etravirine is being dropped. So the older child, we're going to treat like you do adults, but remember we cannot use tenofovir in these patients. In terms of children under three and less than 10 kilograms, we do not use darunavir in these kids because we find that it causes epilepsy in rats. So we are not happy using darunavir. And what, will, what would be used in these kids would dolutegravir with one active NRTI because we know the, uh, in, the other NRTI could be 3TC or FTC that will cripple the virus. Um, I'm going to make special note of pregnant women. We do not do resistance testing in pregnant women. We start them on treatment. And remember, you need to monitor the viral load after three months of being on treatment. And if the viral load is greater than 1,000 copies per mil, I wouldn't even say 1,000 copies per mil. I'll say any detectable viral load needs absolutely intense adherence especially if the patient's on TLD. If the patient's on an NNRTI, you can just switch them to a TLD. But if the patient's on dolutegravir or a PI and is having a detectable viral load, you need to intensify the um, adherence and repeat the viral load after one month. And if that viral load is still higher than 1,000 copies after a month, then you need to consider a HIV resistance test and don't waste any time and switch patients onto the appropriate second line treatment to prevent that baby from becoming infected. In summary, the HIV resistance testing and the approach to treatment failure is complex and it changes all the time. You're going to see the new guidelines come out shortly. And the new guidelines in both the private and the state sector is not simple, it's quite complex. But at all times, you're most free to contact either myself or Dr. Levine. If you're contacting me, you can WhatsApp me on my WhatsApp cell number. And if you want to contact Dr. Levine, who has a team of people working with him, and he's going to explain how he works. Over to you, Dr. Levine. Yeah, thanks, Dr. K. So people are welcome to phone our Right to Care HIV helpline. We've got two helplines. The the HIV helpline, the TB helpline. I'm involved in the HIV helpline. And we try to be available for you while you're busy with your patient. If you've got an issue, you can phone us straight away and we'll try as far as possible to be able to help you. Obviously, we can't always, but as far as possible to help you with. And it can be from really simple stuff to complicated stuff. We're happy to help you. And that's the number. Please feel free to give us a call. Uh, you can also send us a WhatsApp or you can uh, please call me and we'll phone you back, no problem. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Levin and Dr. Mohamed. That was really interesting. Um, in the meantime, let's invite questions. Um, you can put your questions on the Q&A chat um, in the chat box. You'll see next to where you have chat, you see Q&A only. Please type any questions that you have for the presenters there and we'll start taking questions very soon. Um, while you're typing the questions, I'd like to make two announcements. First is that there is an available free learning guide that you can download. Um, Claire has told me that it's on the author's um, page. Claire, can you help us navigate to that author's page? How do participants so get to that page? Sure. So I have published it. I'm not exactly sure where the audience will see it. Maybe they can type in and see if they can see it. Um, I've published it under offers, which is under polls, but please do let me know. I will also put the link in the chat, in the chat box. So it'll be there for you. 
Great. Thank you so much, Claire. So that learning guide is basically um, uh, an introduction to HIV drug resistance, and we try and go into details of what's happening around the world. Um, and so that's free and available for anyone to download. And then the second announcement that I have is that in the next webinar, we're trying to cover real life cases. And so we invite people to submit um, real life cases that you know they want us to discuss. We invite people to submit um, their cases to uh, an email that Claire is gonna put in the chat as well. And if you can submit your cases by May 1st, we'll really appreciate it. The, web the next webinar will probably be June 26th. Uh, that's our tentative webinar date. So if you submit your cases by May 1st, we'll be able to include it in um, the next this webinar discussions where we will look at case studies um, around HIV drug resistance. And so I will um, go on to questions. Let's see where we'll start. Let's see. Okay. So we have a few questions and um, I will start from, maybe I'll start from Dr. Mohammed. Um, we have a question asking about exclusive breastfeeding versus mixed. And my guess is that it's in terms of um, PMTCT as well as, yeah, I think in terms of PMTCT, what's the guideline um, veering towards exclusive versus mixed breastfeeding? So let's start from there and then we'll jump to the next question. Um, in the state sector, um, when we drew up our guidelines, we went with the World Health Organization's decision. And because um, South Africa is considered third world, we went with um, breastfeeding as opposed to formula feeding. So we weren't too worried about HIV transmission at the time. We just wanted a live baby. So we said we will exclusively encourage, we will encourage exclusive breastfeeding. Um, I'm not sure if I should say this, Dr. Levine. In the private sector, the medical aides do pay for formula for um, six months in babies. So um, I, I think the state facilities would also never be able to afford providing formula for six months. And also then as how formula is provided in terms of running water, electricity, and they thought the safer option would be to go with breastfeeding. So in the state facilities, they do encourage um, breastfeeding, whereas in private, we encourage formula feeding because we're able to give patients formula milk. The medical aides would pay for it. And we know that mixed feeding is totally discouraged. Dr. Levine, would you like to add anything more to that? Yeah, I think it, it is a little bit different if the, if the, the mom is far used to be if the mom is is is, is virus suppressed. Obviously it's, it's it's good to to try to do exclusive breastfeeding, but we know um that practically that virtually never happens. But I think as long as the mom is virus suppressed, I think it's the uh, WHO is saying it's not it's not as much a worry as it was previously. Okay. Thank you so much for that answer. And um, moving on to another question. Um, someone is asking whether we can repeat the issue of drug-to-drug -drug interaction as a factor of, I think she means acquired HIV drug resistance. Um, I'm not exactly sure. I think Dr. Levin. Yeah, I spoke about, about that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, so remember we said, well, to simplify it, um, we said that what causes resistance? Low levels of ARVs plus viral replication. But if you want to, so, so if you're going to say what is going to cause low levels of ARVs, we all obviously know poor adherence. But the other causes of low levels of ARVs, like patients who have got malabsorption problems, for example, or being underdosed. So drug interactions also will result in low levels of ARVs. So for example, the cytochrome P450 CYP3A4 enzyme, which metabolizes your protease inhibitors, for example, right? So normally it just nibbles at them and it doesn't do much. And the drug companies take that into account with the dosing and give a slightly bigger dose, and we don't have a problem. But if you put that patient onto rifampicin, 
for TB treatment. Now, rifampicin induces the enzyme. So in simple terms, makes the enzyme hyperactive. So instead of just nibbling a little bit of the drug, it gobbles it all up like a Pac-Man. And you get low levels of your protease inhibitor, your lipinaritonin, your, your atazanaritonin, your darunavir. And then obviously, you've got the same scenario. Low levels of ARVs, viral replication causes viral resistance. So we see that with the protease inhibitors, we see that with the integrase inhibitors, with rifampicin, we see that, as Kelly mentioned, with the anti-epileptic drugs, um, also with dolutegravir, remember, um, you know, polyvalent cations, like um, Dr. K mentioned, antacids, calcium, magnesium, iron, zinc, any of these can interfere with the absorption of, of dolutegravir and can cause low levels and then potentially cause resistance. And that's why you don't give them at the same time as your dolutegravir. So I hope that explains how drug interactions can, can cause drug resistance. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Levine. Uh, um, um, yes. Can I just ask, Dr. Levine, would you not like to just say quickly about double dosing dolutegravir with patients on TB treatment? Yeah, thanks for giving the opportunity. So with the protease, uh, protease inhibitors in adults, how do you overcome this? You would double up the dose of lopinavirtonavir, right? We only talk about lopinavirtonavir. But in children who can't swallow the tablets whole, lopinavirtonavir has to be swallowed whole. Otherwise, absorption goes down by 40%. Then you have to super boost with extra rotonavir. But sometimes you can't get hold of extra rotonavir and then people double dose because I think it works in adults. Unfortunately, it doesn't work in adults and you get resistance. Okay. Remember that double dosing only applies to lopinavirtonavir. Atazanavirtonavir, we don't know what to do. You can't, you can't adjust the atazanavirtonavir. You can use rifabutin instead of rifampicin. And same with darunavir. Okay, you can't double dose the darunavir, but it's only with lopinavirtonavir, Dr. K is right, in adults, you would, or if they're on a, the lopinavirtonavir tablets, you can double up the dose. But if it's a child who's on the, not on the tablets, is on the solution or the pellets or the four-in-one, there you would have to add in extra rotonavir to, to boost that and overcome the effect of rifampicin. Thanks, Dr. K, for reminding me about that. Thank you so much. Um, so I will join the question here. We talked a lot about TLD and the rollout, the wide rollout of TLD. And so just from a practitioner's perspective, how do we ensure that we maintain this efficacy of dolutegravil, our magic drug? How do we really ensure as practitioners that we're maintaining okay. efficacy? Because after dolutegravil, I don't think there's any new drug, at least not now. And so I would just open the floor for discussions. Um, Dr. Levine or Dr. Mohamed, any of you can take it. Um, if Obi, can you just repeat the question again? Or well, do you want me um, to stop and start and then Kay can gather her thoughts? Okay, 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 okay. So, it's a good question how do we maintain Jolly Tegrava working forever and ever? And the truth is, we can't, and we're not going to be able to. And we are going to be dealing with Jolly Tegrava resistance. I must say, already, I'm seeing it I actually work with. We have a, a one tomorrow afternoon, a, an African advanced clinic where we, we see cases. And remember, they've had dolutegra for much longer than us. And I think all the cases we're dealing with tomorrow are dolutegra resistance. So we're going to see dolutegra resistance. There's not a question we're going to see it. In patients who are first line, on a first line dolutegra regimen, okay? Now, new guidelines, we call them TLD1s, right? There you virtually never see resistance. If they've never been on ARVs before, you know, dolutegra virtually, I think there's two cases in the, in the literature of resistance. So, in fact, in new guidelines, they're not, not even going to do, not even going to change the regimen. It's just purely adherence. You deal with adherence. But if they're on a the second line dolutegra regimen, they've been on other ARVs before. Then we do see resistance, and we are going to, we are going to see more and more resistance. So the policy that we use in our new guidelines is to say we want to get as many people as possible onto TLD, onto dolutegra regimens, being aware that sometimes we're not going to get it right. So what we always try to do is to make sure there is a backup situation. In other words, if the patient is on a, um, a first line efferent regimen and you change to TLD and you get it wrong, no problem, you've got a protease inhibitor. If they're on a protease inhibitor regimen and they're suppressed, you can change to TLD because you know you for the protease inhibitor is working, they're suppressed. 
if they're on a protein inhibitor for less than two years, we know that you don't develop resistance until two years. So no problem, you can switch them to, to TLD because you know you've got the backup of the protein inhibitor. So that's how we try to preserve it while you'll see everybody's going to go virtually onto TLD. Um, but you want to try as far as possible to make sure they've got a backup of a protease inhibitor. Doesn't always happen. There's some situation where your back's against the wall and there's no ways you can, you've got a non-adherent teenager that just nothing is working and you go into TLD and they suppress and hopefully they'll stay suppressed. But we are going to see issues and that's why we need Thermo Fisher because we are going to need to do more resistance testing. At the moment, we can't afford to do resistance testing on all the patients who are failing TLD1. And because we know that there's been so little resistance, we're going to have to test so many patients to pick up so many. So that's why we don't do it. But if it was cheaper, we might very well be doing it. So Thermo Fisher, don't worry, we'll be needing you <laughs> very much <laughs> in the future. But I think we can have a bit of a honeymoon phase now with TLD where everybody's going to suppress it, you're wonderful, and then all of a sudden, we're going to start getting these cases. That's that's my prediction, and that's what I'm seeing already a bit in Africa, I must be honest. But yeah, it's still it's a great drug. Please use it. Dr. K, I'm <laughs> I know you're going to kill me, but I'm going to say it. So I say to all my patients, and if you don't take your treatment properly, I'll kill you. <laughs> yeah, that's not a lie. That's true. And, About the medical it was a lie. It's just true. And, and that's that's why I can have a hundred percent virally undetectable practice. Right. Because firstly they're so scared, but also I think if we're using Dolutegra, we know that is that it has a really high barrier to resistance. But having said that, what we need to understand as well, its side effects and toxicity profile is not much. And I think this makes a dip big difference. And we see this with the use of atazanavir. So atazanavir might not have the high genetic barrier that lopinavir has, but because lopinavir has this high pull burden and the side effects, that's why it falls away. Whereas atazanavir doesn't feature anywhere there, but just because of the convenience, it works. So I think, um, you know, between threatening the patients and, 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 letting them understand that the first thing you do when you get up in the morning and you go to the bathroom, you drink your meds. No one needs to remind you. It just becomes a reflex. You have a glass of water with that, which is an excellent thing from a health point of view. You, you, you can't say to me, I forgot, because you have no reason to forget, because every morning you brush your teeth, don't you? And the odd person would say, no, I don't. Then you say, then you no, use the bathroom, don't, don't you? <laughs> So I, no, think just don't not, it. <laughs> I think it's not just the resistance issues. It's also the fact that it doesn't have a bad toxicity or, or side yeah. effect profile. And I think if you can impart that kind of confidence onto your patients, you'll reap the, the, the rewards of that. Uh, yeah. could, I, could I add to that? To just yes. Answer. Yeah, no, Dr. K, first of all, I must just say on this public forum, I never shouted my patients. I think it's bad medicine and I, I don't encourage that you want to do this fine but I don't encourage it I also get good viral suppression from talking to my patients but I don't shout them but besides that point just to one little point that to, to mention is we know Dolitech has got a high genetic barrier to resistance okay but if you remember Dr K mentioned the Nadia trial we haven't got time to go into it on the Nadia trial in the Darunova arm there was zero Darunova resistance but there were nine cases of Dolutegravir resistance. So it's not as robust as we think. It, yes, it's got a high genetic barrier, but you do get resistance to it, and we will be seeing more resistance. So it's a lovely honeymoon time we're going through now. It's all hunky-dory, but just be aware, okay, we are going to need Thermo Fisher in the next few years. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Levin. Thanks, Dr. K. And I will take maybe one last question from the audience. So someone talked about viral load testing overloading the lab capacity. Have you seen that to be the case in South Africa? Now, look, so in, the, in the government setting, it's strictly regulated when you do viral loads. And so I don't, and, you know, I think we have capacity and it's, it's fine. And I don't think it's an issue in the private sector. Um, I think also the managed healthcare organizations do limit the number of viral loads that can be done. Um, so I don't think it is a major issue. I don't know what your experience, Dr. K. 
Um, we kind of know what we're doing. So I think that's why it's never going to be an issue because we, if we're switching from first line to second line, we're doing no testing. And if we're switching, switching from second line to third line, then we are hundred percent certain that we sorted out the adherence and then there are resistance issues there. So I, I, I think we're doing good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I see I have 30 more seconds. So I will just throw in this question of next gen sequencing, which, you know, after COVID, a lot of countries acquired the capacity for next generation sequencing. And so I just want to just throw it out there. If there's an application in drug resistance testing and expanding it to next gen sequencing, so using the capacity that has been built from COVID to do drug resistance testing. And I know someone mentioned the minor variant, how you know genotyping can pick up anything more than 20 to 30%. Just to talk maybe a little bit more about the clinical relevance of this minor variant. Are they really relevant to clinicians? Should we be trying to use next-gen sequencing to detect them? What's their clinical relevance? Dr. K, you want to answer that? Dr. Levine, I was just thinking, I, I suppose in a way it also all boils down to cost as well. So I think because our tests cost so much money is why, you know, we, we, we have to really be very firm on making sure that they take their treatment properly and we can only do it after we are 100% sure. Um, Dr. Levine is going to kill me. I've threatened them and they take their treatment. I'm going to kill you, Dr. <laughs> <laughs> that you know that they 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 taking their treatment properly and like I say I say to them as well that if the test comes up saying that you're not taking your treatment properly the medical aids will make you pay for that so I think if the, the costs come down we'd be a lot freer but when you know you're sitting with costs that are right up there you it's like your last resort you know so I think the the cost also plays a big part okay, okay. Uh, okay, great. Thank you. I think we're at time. So I will stop here now and hand over to Claire. But just a reminder for people, I did put the email to send the case, um, any cases that you have that you want to be discussed in the next webinar. I put the email in the chat and I think maybe we might send it out um, later. Um, but I'll talk with Claire about that. And so I'll hand over to Claire to close us out. Thank you. Thank you so much, firstly, to our presenters, Dr. Mohammed and Dr. Levine. Really appreciate all the time and effort that's gone into this. To Thurma Fisher for making this possible tonight and for us to educate all of our audience. It's been fantastic. So thank you so much for your dedication to that. And as always, to our audience, for your excellent questions, for your attendance. I know this was a longer one tonight, but we still had almost 200 people um, attending at the moment. So really, thank you so much, doctors, for everything that you do and for your attendance. And I really thank you all and, and wish you a very good week. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Bye.